Hi everyone, this video will go over the ethics of whistleblowing. In this video, we'll define whistleblowing, we'll discuss the unfortunate reality of the practice, guidelines for the practice, and the relationship between whistleblowing and employee loyalty. So what is whistleblowing? Well, our textbook defines it as the disclosure of certain abuses in a company by an employee in which he or she is employed without the consent of his or her superiors in order to remedy these abuses and or to warn the public about them. So in essence, you have information about some abuses, something wrong that's going on in the particular company that you're working for or you're under contract with, and you go to an authority. It could be to the public, it could be to some higher up, even sometimes there's internal whistleblowing and report to a higher up within your own company without the consent of your superior, or perhaps you go to some regulator, government officials, some other authorities or the public with information in order to remedy whatever the particular issue is. Some examples, but of course not limited to these things, uh, would be endangerment, violations of the law, deception of the public or government, abuse of power, sexual harassment, and discrimination. The unfortunate reality of whistleblowing is that it can lead to significant negative consequences for those who practice it. Many lose their jobs, some face public ridicule. Some find it hard to find employ employment after blowing the whistle. Some even lose friendships and contact with family members. There is a very real significant cost that some people uh, that are whistleblowers face. Now, this isn't always the case, but there is a risk involved. So the question then is, well, why do you do it? Well, if you ask whist whistleblowers why they did what they did, even though they had full knowledge of these negative consequences that they were going to face, and many of them did face those negative consequences, most of the time they'll still say, well, I still would do it all over again. Well, why? Because it's the right thing to do. Morality demands you to do so. Self-sacrifice is sometimes required to protect others or to stop abuses. And we talked about this previously in the class, the concept of a hero, and that's what a hero is right? Uh, someone who takes on personal risk to either prevent terrible things from happening or to help other people. Very often, our, the professional codes demand such a thing. In some cases, this also is demanded in corporate codes as well. Our textbook then gives us the, the following guidelines. These are from the ethicist Richard DeGeorge back in 1990. He wrote, the following guidelines for when whistleblowing is morally required. First one is that the organization will do serious uh, and considerable harm. The organization to which the would-be whistleblower belongs will, through its product or policy, do serious and considerable harm to the public, whether to the users of the uh, product or to innocent bystanders or the public at large. The next is that the would-be whistleblower has identified the threat of harm, reported it to her immediate superior, making it clear both the threat itself and the object to it, and concluded that the superior will do nothing effective. Next, the would-be whistleblower has exhausted other internal procedures within the organization, for example, by going up the organizational ladder as far as permitted, or at least made use of the many internal procedures as the danger to others and her own safety make responsible uh, or reasonable rather. So the idea here is that it's just not your first move to make. You give other, give the opportunity to your employer to make the right call and you try to fix it internally first before going straight to the, the press, for example. Next, the would-be whistleblower has access to evidence that would convince a reasonable impartial observer that her view of the threat is correct. So this particular guideline says essentially you need to be able to prove your claims, that you're not just going to the public with hearsay that ultimately won't do anything. That leads us to the next one, which is the idea that the would-be whistleblower has a good reason to believe that revealing the threat will probably prevent the harm at reasonable cost, all things considered. This actually has a couple parts to it. One, you should think that by being a whistleblower, it will actually 
have some type of change involved, be able to prevent the harm, etc., and that the cost is worth that it's a reasonable cost, all things considered. Now let's move on to our next article, Whistleblowing and Employee Loyalty by Ronald Duska. The essential question that Duska is asking in this article is, when is whistleblowing morally permissible? And he looks at the traditional view and is very critical of it. He says the traditional view is that whistleblowing violates a duty of loyalty to your employer. As such, it can only be justified in extreme circumstances. And more or less, that's what we saw with the guidelines by DeGeorge. He basically gave these very strict guidelines and more or less was a last resort under very strict circumstances that you would actually be a whistleblower. So he says that in this traditional view, cases where a higher duty, such as the duty to public welfare, overrides it. We have to have pretty extreme cases for you to go against the loyalty to your employer. And this is something he wants to point out, that we see view as inherently disloyal, that whistleblowing is as disloyalty is the starting point. And there's a key assumption here that employees have a duty of loyalty to employers. In fact, many codes of conduct explicitly say that, that you do have a certain duty of loyalty to those that employ you. This is something that he's going to question, however. Could we have inherent loyalty to employers, to those that pay us? Most philosophers and, and ethicists contemplating this question more or less just assume that's the case. But he questions this central assumption. Instead, Duska claims that we do not have a moral duty of loyalty to our employers. But why? Well, let's unpack what he means here and why he claims it. Duska claims that loyalty is only owed to things that fulfill two general categories. One, persons. Loyalty can only be owed to individuals in which you have special relationships with. Examples would be, well, family and friends. He does think that it is possible that you should have loyalty to groups, where you can think perhaps in a business as being a group of individuals, uh, but the group which has the purpose of mutual enrichment of the members. So he states that loyalty is incompatible with self-interest because it is something that necessarily requires we go beyond self-interest. So companies, he says, are neither one of these things. Companies aren't people, they aren't individuals. They aren't a group that has the purpose of mutual en enrichment of its members. Very often the purpose of a business is actually to make the owners of the business rich, right? So companies are, in Duska's view, aren't inherently one of these two things. They can't be a person, they are a group of people and very often, as a group of people, they aren't meant to, to have this mutual enrichment of its members. So there is no inherent more obligation to be loyal to your company. Now, perhaps one of the main objections here is to number two. Well, clearly you can't really argue that a company is a person, a human being, but you could argue that companies inherently are of groups of number two, the nature of them are mutual enrichment of its members. He's going to argue against that in the following way. He says that the reality is what an employer is, is that they're a business that aims to do two things. One, produce goods or services, but that's a means to an end. The primary purpose of any employer, of any business, is to make a profit. And this primary function of a business is to make a profit to enrich, once again, the owners of that business. And for most businesses, the owners aren't the employees. This is not a group, as he puts it, bound together for mutual fulfillment and support, but to divide labor so the business makes a profit. As such, there is no moral duty of loyalty. With such a goal, there is no loyalty, or at least none need to be expected. Companies do not have loyalty to you. He gives an example to illustrate this. A couple of examples, in fact. Uh, one we can call the carpenter example, the other the restructuring example. So the idea behind these examples is that he's claiming that employers, they freely fire employees when they're no longer profitable. 
and ultimately they do not have loyalty to you so this idea of them being a a member of that second category that of things that deserve loyalty these groups that have mutual enrichment that simply says is not the case for businesses employers etc the carpenter example so going straight to the text here he says i might go to work for a company as a carpenter and love the job and get satisfaction out of doing good work but if the company can increase profit by cutting back to an adequate but inferior type of material or procedure it can make it impossible for me to take pride in my work as a carpenter while making it possible for me to make more money the company does not exist to subsidize my quality work as a carpenter as a carpenter my goal may be good houses but as an employee, my goal is to contribute to making a profit. That's just business. The second example he gives is what we can call the restructuring example. And going back to the text again, he says, loyalty to a corporation then is not required, but even more, it is probably misguided. There is nothing as pathetic as the story of the loyal employee being given above and beyond the call of duty is let go in the restructuring of the company. He feels betrayed because he mistakenly viewed the company as an object of his loyalty. To get rid of such foolish romanticism and to come to grips with this hard but accurate assessment should ultimately benefit everyone. So what he's saying here is look at these examples of individuals who lose their jobs, even if they've been there for many years and sometimes decades. I've known individuals that this has happened to, where they've been a part of a company for literally decades, and then just as a cost-saving measure, they're let go. They feel slighted. They're upset. They feel betrayed because they feel like they uh, have been very loyal to the company and that is not reciprocated. But he says, once again, they're just doing what they're made to do, doing what it takes to make a profit, and that's the main goal. If that's the case, then they inherently won't have loyalty to the employees. Unless perhaps you could say there are some companies that are employee owned. Well, that might make a difference there. But the vast majority of companies are not that way. Jessica says the cold hard truth is that the goal of profit is what gives birth to a company and forms that particular group. Money is what ties that group together not this mutual benefits. Duska states that one sells one's labor, but not oneself to a company or to an institution. Since we all are merely selling our labor, we aren't selling our loyalty. They inherently don't have loyalty to us. They have loyalty to making a profit. We then should also not see us as having to have, morally speaking, loyalty to your employer as a result. Another point that Duska makes is to instill this idea that companies are not people. This seems obvious, but sure, they're made up of individuals, but a company itself is not a person. They are instruments to make a profit. He thinks that one mistake that people often make is to treat companies as if they are people. It is wrong, he thinks, to treat an instrument, such as companies, businesses, employers, as an end in itself. So we can see some Kantian reasoning here. It's wrong to treat them as a person. Companies must be used and be regulated accordingly, as institutions, as instruments, not as human beings, not as rational autonomous agents. He says, I owe it no more loyalty then I owe a word processor. Going back to Kantian ethics here, he states to treat an instrument as an end in itself, like a person, you know, might not be as bad as treating an end as an instrument, but it does give the instrument a moral status it does not deserve. And by elevating the instrument, we lower the end. All things, instruments and ends become alike. So he notes there's this in inherent problem of treating things that aren't people as if they are people. And he says that's what we generally do when we're dealing with businesses and corporations and saying we owe them this loyalty to them as if they were people.
So what are the implications of his views of loyalty to whistleblowing? Well, at the very end of the article, he goes into this. Since we shouldn't feel like we have a moral obligation to have loyalty to our company, there should be no consideration of loyalty to your company when considering whistleblowing. So once again, going back to his original traditional view is the opposite of this, that we have to take our loyalty to our company, take that in consideration first, and we only can act on whistleblowing when it overrides that loyalty. He says that's wrong. Uh, that consideration of loyalty is misplaced. Instead, the primary considerations are the harms that could be prevented, not loyalty. He then gives a new set of guidelines, or I guess I should say a different set of guidelines, that aren't quite as strict as what we saw before. Now, he didn't come up with these all on his own. They're actually based on uh, others by Simon Power and Gunneman. Sadeska so claims that whistleblowing is morally required under four conditions. The first one is need, that there is a clear harm that can be avoided. The second is proximity. It is the proximity to the whistleblower that gives them the position to report in the first place. Third is capability. There is a reasonable chance for success. So you're not expected to risk yourself, you know, as we've talked about previously, for nothing. Finally, last resort. There are other means that are not as costly to you and others. Well, you should try those first. So finally, uh, I just want to end here with some questions. Take a minute and think about these guidelines we, that have been given. We saw two different sets of guidelines. Do you agree with these? Why or why not? Do they go far enough? Are these guidelines sufficient on their own? Uh, or perhaps they are missing some key things, some key considerations that should be included. Or perhaps in some cases they go too far. Are each of the requirements necessary for whistleblowing to be morally obligatory? Perhaps it's morally obligatory without certain of the guidelines. That's all for today. I look forward to reading your thoughts and responses to these concepts.